Okay. I'll admit it. Metal Ween has not had that much metal in it. I mean, we had Kiss and Alice Cooper, but they're kind of shock rock. And apart from John Michael Thor, the most metal we've had on the show was just shitty ass new metal. And no one likes new metal. So today, let's talk about something that relates to THE heavy metal band Iron Fucking Maiden! <laughs> That's right, Bruce Dickinson, the voice of metal's most iconic group, wrote a movie about famed occultist Aleister Crowley, and I bought it for 50 cents. That's less than I paid for Thor and the Magical Hammer. It's also a confusing mess. There were some movies, terrible movies, movies so awful. No one would touch. Then came a Matthew, sad little Matthew. Matthew decided these movies to watch. For every good movie, there's at least ten bad. Matthew doesn't drag himself through the crap to find the worst ones around to be had. Today's episode Crowley. <sighs> Hello, O Earth and Sea. I am the Devil's Beast sent with wrath, and today we're looking at Bruce Dickinson's one and only foray into filmmaking. First off, good luck finding any information on this film, because when you look it up on IMDb, yeah, that's the box cover, but this is not the Crowley I have. See, it's listed under its original British title, Chemical Wedding, which wouldn't be the problem if the cover of this film weren't on another page. Also, the title Chemical Wedding kind of makes me think of a band that isn't Iron Maiden. Nah, uh, 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 metal ween, not mediocre pop punk ween. Although my computer calls it undefined. Guess you get what you pay for. The film was directed by Julian Doyle, who's previously worked as an editor on a lot of Monty Python and Terry Gilliam movies. His directing resume, however, is lacking to say the least. The film stars Simon Callow, an actually well-respected British actor who's appeared in such films as Shakespeare in Love and Phantom of the Opera. Which, granted, are both really shitty movies, but he does have some credibility. The rest of the cast isn't huge, but they're way above the shit I'd normally review. And I suppose we should address the subject matter of Aleister Crowley, the so-called wickedest man in the world. He was some crazy old dude who did a bunch of drugs and masturbated a lot. If that's wicked to you, you must be terrified of college campuses. And seriously, to give that title to some guy who never hurt anyone just because he was into some crazy occult shit over people like Hitler, Stalin, Pinochet, Ivan the Terrible, Genghis Khan, and the list goes on? Even as far as cult leaders go, L. Ron Hubbard is more evil than this guy. I do know a bit about Aleister Crowley, so I will be judging the film on some loose sense of accuracy. Then again, the last time someone brought up Aleister Crowley on this show, it was in Things, where they tried to call him a murderer. I can't even find proof of him trying to curse anyone. He was genuinely just some crazy dude. Uh, one last thing before we begin. I only bought this movie because I have a friend named Crowley. I didn't even realize Bruce Dickinson had written it. So, uh, let's see if this beast can make me run to the hills. This is Crowley. Or Crowley. They pronounce it both ways in the movie, but, uh, you know, Ozzy calls him Crowley, so I'll stick with Crowley. That's what I'm talking about. Metal. And, uh, duty saxophone music? Oh, but it does take place in Hastings, England. Which is kind of coincidental, because I bought this from a Hastings when it was closing. It's how I got it for 50 cents. Ah, oh, rest in peace, Hastings. You were the coolest place in Nacogdoches. Anyway, the film opens with some kids bringing mail to an elderly Aleister Crowley. Do what thou wilt. 
Ah, cause that's the thing Crowley said. I remember how every time someone walked up to Jesus, he just went, Love thy neighbor. Crowley goes into some weird, esoteric magic shit, which, you know, Crowley did, so I can't complain about inaccuracy. I can complain that it's not very compelling dialogue. They invoke my scarlet ritual to produce a moon child. It's dense and confusing and also absolutely necessary to understanding the plot later. As much as you can understand the plot in this film. A moon child is an elemental, a reincarnated soul in a body created by ritual. By sexual magic. Did somebody say bisexual magic? Are we are we still doing the closet bit? Have I not made it abundantly clear I'm bisexual? I'm bisexual. We're ending this bit. There's not even enough room in this closet for me to stand. Mr. Crowley. If you talk to well, we're less than 10 minutes in and I already used that joke. I apologize for my existence. And then Crowley curses the hand that steals his time. I curse the hand that steals my time. And then he dies. Oh, what? You expected this movie about Aleister Crowley to be about Aleister Crowley? Nah, fuck that shit. This is about some guy at Cambridge or... Some other British universe. It's unclear where it takes place. It's now the early 2000s, and we meet Dr. Mathers. The mutant combination of Dr. Dre and Eminem. And the redhead is Leah, who asks Dr. Mathers for an interview for the school paper, which he agrees to because she gets a question wrong. Okay, you're standing on a moving train, you jump up in the air, do you land in the same spot? Yes. Um, no. No, you land further back? Oh, was I right? No. Mathers has come to see a piece of technology the unnamed British University is working on. Uh, what was that? Ah, just talking to himself, okay. Hey, 15 minutes in, might as well meet the actual main character, Dr. Haddo. I guess he's arguably the antagonist. He has a stutter and is apparently one of Crowley's followers. He knows this spell. Water into wine. I suppose that power is more useful for evil than good, but can he turn Coke into Pepsi? Anyway, the computer thing Dr. Mathers is working on was created by this character, Victor, to perform evil rituals. He's even programmed a version of Crowley into the system to link the users mentally with him. I, I think. This movie's confusing. And Haddo is in a big Freemason thing with all the other professors in the school. Yeah, the Masons. That's the religion Crowley founded. This makes perfect sense. That was the last time I know I saw Haddo alive. Who, who said that? Is there narration in this movie now? That's the only line of narration in the whole film. Anyway, Haddo gets in the machine and links up with Crowley. If that is what this machine does. Although Mather seems to want to use it to cure Alzheimer's or something. Uh, it was personal, actually. It's, I watched my father succumb to... Alzheimer's, and I thought that if I could somehow save his memory... The next day, Victor is having trouble finding Haddo. Luckily, or perhaps unfortunately, he's giving a modern classic speech about Hamlet. He shows up bald, having noticeably lost weight, and speaking without a speech impediment. Wait, getting possessed means you can lose weight? I just found the next great weight loss program! Come sacrifice those pounds to Satan! And that is what happened, by the way. Haddo was possessed by Aleister Crowley. Th that's the movie. William Shakespeare was an occultist. His characters, Titania and Oberon, are veiled facsimiles of the ancient Egyptian gods. Hamlet? Not... not Macbeth? You know, Macbeth, the play with witches? 
The play that starts with witches? You know, Double Double Toil and Trouble? You remember Double Double Toil and Trouble, right? Because Google doesn't. It thinks it's an Olsen Twins movie. Google, I was talking about Shakespeare, not the Olsen Twins. The Olsen Twins are the opposite of Shakespeare. Some other technical notes. The audio quality is inconsistent, and the lighting is bad. So says the guy with inconsistent audio and bad lighting. And then he pisses on the front row. Whoa-ho! They didn't warn me this show had a splash zone! Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Ah, he said it again. In ten years' time, that is the only lecture those students will ever remember. That's hardly an explanation, Dr. Haddock. I disagree. That's a fair point. You may refer to me as the Beast. Oh, the Beast. I am aware of his number. Bruce told me about it. Then he quotes a bunch of naughty Bible verses about sex. Wow, so evil. Not like every sixth grader at church camp doesn't do that same thing. My personal favorite is 1 Samuel 25, 22, but uh, you gotta read the King James Version for that to be funny. And shocking twist? The kid from the beginning is now a professor at unnamed British University, and he has a robot friend. What? Are you reading his books? I mean, I assume it's a person. He's got a robot voice, so it might be Stephen Hawking. And had Dowley spooks Dr. Mathers by revealing a lot of information about him. First girlfriend, Susan? Yes? And Susan was my first girlfriend. When I was nine. Time out, time out, time out, time out. Alistair, baby. Nothing before the age of 16 counts. Magical meeting on the astral plane. <laughs> Come on. Scientists don't believe in magic. You've got to believe in cause and effect. Really? What about the uncertainty principle? We can't explain something, so it's magic. A very scientific point of view. Crowley burns Victor's porn, which isn't cool, bro. But he does make a porn star appear in the room, which is pretty cool. He even gives him a little helping hand with jerking off. And then he stabs him in the face. So, uh, I think that balances out to not cool, bro. Oh, but he's fine the next day. There's a good chance I don't know what's happening in this movie. Okay, so the suit is a virtual reality suit that also summons Aleister Crowley. Well, like I always say, makes sense to me. But Dr. Brent, who's inside the suit, goes somewhere he's not supposed to and finds Haddo Crowley. And then the coolest part of the movie happens. I imagine you're the lead singer of Iron Maiden, and you, you write this wild, esoteric script about Aleister Crowley, and you're like, what's the finishing touch? What's the one thing it still needs? I know, something straight out of John Carpenter's The Thing. And that kills him. Then Crowley just wanders around to this jaunty little tune. Also, Bush and Gore? This movie came out in 08, two elections later. Is this a period piece set in 2000? Or did this just sit on a shelf for eight years? Because it really seems like the latter. And then he goes and joins ISIS. Okay. Isis was an Egyptian goddess, and Crowley was into that type of thing. Crowley needs a redhead for a scarlet wedding, but the prostitute he hired isn't a natural. Because... pagan powers know if you're a natural or not. But you know who is a natural redhead? Leah, the girl I've barely mentioned, because despite being in a lot of this film, she barely does anything. Anyway, Crowley kills that girl. The real Aleister Crowley still never killed anyone. He's holding some sort of ritual in the attic of the ISIS building that somehow Mathers got into? And this is where the movie goes completely off the fucking rails. Crowley's heart is beating through his chest, this girl pisses herself, Crowley and Victor are somehow outside the ritual they were just in, in totally different clothes? 
What the fuck is going on? And then Crowley beats the shit out of a homeless man, but hey, there's some metal music. And the people at that ritual are having a lit-ass orgy, which is cool. Except Mathers. He leaves. And then... something about a beast? Hell and fire was spawned to be released? It might just sound like I'm listing random things off, and... That's exactly how it feels to watch this movie. That's right. Very good. Another bra. Carly, you're in the middle of an ancient ritual and you're stopping to bang a college girl? If there's one thing you should learn today, it's that Alistair Crowley was a horny bastard. Of course, Mathers is also trying to stop said ritual and he has time to bang Leah. So maybe the real message is that we're all horny bastards. Oh, I guess this scene was shot by the Australian unit. Actually, the camera work and editing in this movie are really amateurish. For example, she awaits my call. And then Crowley has a ritual where he gets spanked in order to attract Leah. And and his ass is nowhere near that stick. And then he faxes her his cum. Oh god. There's something wrong with this machine. It's leaking ink or solvent. Or I'm not making that up. He faxed her his cum. And she's just immediately with him. Like, half this film's problems would be solved with some sense of pacing or anything. It jumps from place to place so fast, I swear this movie has ADHD. Oh, uh, no, she's not at his place? Wh what? What do you guys think the odds are the editor just fucked up and left the shot in by accident versus this being an artistic choice? Anyway, that one guy's robot friend is in theoretical physics, which means he is, in fact, Stephen Hawking. I'd explain what he says, but it's incoherent and really not that important. Which I guess could describe this whole movie. So Leah sees Crowley in his house, but then sneaks into the Mason Simple to also meet Crowley. What? At the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. Oh, so you do remember Macbeth. Come to think of it, after Shakespeare in Love, maybe Simon Callow should stay far away from anything Shakespeare related. Also, they're doing drugs, another big tenant of Crowley's religion. So Mathers is trying to figure out what Dr. Brent saw while in the suit. His solution? Replay the events that gave Dr. Brent a heart attack to see if he learns anything new. Brilliant. And, uh, then there's a black hole in the simulation that sends Mathers to the Scarlet Wedding. Why not? I am so beyond trying to figure this shit out. Just end the movie. Then they send Haddo back in time to when he wasn't Crowley, and he's back to normal. Also, the robot man is definitely Stephen Hawking. Parallel universes exist. So in some parallel universe, Alistair Crowley is wandering around. And in that other universe, the world will be a more evil place. A couple of details. I get it, because the Bush presidency was bad. Hey, uh, just putting this out there, a Gore presidency would also have been bad? Probably not as bad, but still, like, pretty fucking bad. All presidents are bad. Oh, and this. Try 12-147. My birthday. <laughs> so Mr. Crown is death. Ah, uh, cause he's Crowley reincarnated. Uh, I have several issues. Uh, to start, if this takes place in 2000, that makes Mathers, this guy, 53 years old. The actor, by the way, was born in 73. So what the fuck? Second, Crowley claimed to be the reincarnate of Eliaphus Levi. 
who died five months before Crowley's birth. So, clearly reincarnation takes some time. Who gives a fuck? The movie's over. That's Crowley. I didn't like it. I feel a little out of my element with this film. It's so incomprehensible that I have to spend time figuring out the plot to even know what to make fun of. I'm usually pretty lenient on metal ween picks because I enjoy their high energy and creativity. Plus, I just want to watch something fun. This is too complicated to be fun. There's an edge of exploitation to it. Like, if this had been made in the 70s, I could see it being a lot of fun. But the wild scenes are few and far between, so it hardly makes for a good exploitative pick. And it's clearly not a good film. If you're looking for something about Aleister Crowley, well, this is mostly fictionalized, and even then, it's so tedious to sit through, you'd be better off reading his Wikipedia article. Really, I hate to shit on something written by such an enormous talent, but Bruce Dickinson should stick to music, because this isn't doing anything for anyone. Man, I went too goofy with my first movie this month, and not goofy enough with the second movie. So luckily, for the finale of Metal Ween, I have picked out the perfect Metal Ween movie. Uh, if you liked this video, you might enjoy me talking about another occultist in film, uh, Anton LaVey in The Devil's Reign. And uh, until next time, I'm Matt, and have a happy Metal Ween. not to pee. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous stricture, or take arms against a closed urethra and by abscission end it. Man, Hastings didn't die for this. Luckily I bought like 40 other movies when Hastings closed. I honestly probably got more out of Hastings' death than its life. That said, I am still very sad about it closing, and miss it dearly, like four years later. R.I.P. Hastings.